Hi, my name is Mark Auerbach. I'm a pediatric emergency physician at Yale and work with Connecticut Emergency Medical Services for Children as well as the National EMSC EIIC Center. Today I'm going to talk to you about do-it-yourself simulation skills or DIY. This is an important topic as while simulation is a very effective technique for learning, it is sometimes a technique that is limited by your resources and available equipment. As an outline for this talk, first we'll start with simulation as an effective way to learn or develop skills and to maintain skills. The discussion of high fidelity or high technology simulation versus lower fidelity or lower technology simulation. Some of the concepts or constructs of teaching or educating your staff with simulation. And a roadmap of our do-it-yourself simulation module that we've created for you to use in your emergency department and or your EMS agency with your providers. So what is simulation? Simulation is immersive. It's something that involves suspension of disbelief and it can really occur anytime or anywhere. It's about the technique, not the technology. So this technique replaces or amplifies real life experiences with guided experiences. These experiences are interactive and immersive. And depending upon the level of technology or what we call fidelity or realism, the simulations can be really well accepted by the team and really feel realistic or sometimes even with higher technology or higher realism they might not feel as realistic for your staff so it's all about how you engage your staff and discussing with them some concepts of suspending disbelief meaning taking this seriously and participating and getting engaged and simulation can be used with all types of learners in all phases of training. So for the medical students at the hospital or the paramedic students or nursing students, all the way up through experienced and very expert clinicians and physicians and medics. The importance of the model of simulation is not about the model of the simulator, but is about the model of your education and training. So for each simulation session, you want to have a focused skill or set of what we call learning objectives. And those learning objectives might be very discrete or focused on a specific psychomotor skill, like we'll talk about now with the simulations for do-it-yourself simulation, or more broad, like teamwork or navigating systems issues. The simulations can involve individuals or they can involve teams of providers working together to take care of patients. And they can occur, again, anywhere and anytime. Sometimes they'll occur in the emergency department, sometimes they'll occur in a training center, and currently during the pandemic, sometimes they're occurring at home. So why simulation in pediatrics emergency care? So we talk about the importance of simulation for high stakes and rare events. Sometimes we term these halo events. So simulation can be building confidence for these events, meaning improving the providers feeling that they're prepared for the events, but much more importantly, it can enhance the provider's skills, not only of the individual provider, but of the teams of providers. So simulation can be used for things ranging from those high stakes rare events, such as resuscitation of a pediatric patient that is critically ill or injured, or procedures. And procedures for pediatrics may be uncommon in your emergency department. If you see only a handful of patients a day, or even if you see more than that, uh, procedures uh, such as reducing a fracture or placing an IV or draining an abscess may be uncommon in your emergency department and are really important to practice. And particularly for procedures to understand the pediatric pearls or tips. And that's what we're hoping to cover in some of the simulations and do-it-yourself simulations. So why simulation in pediatric emergency care? Simulation is a key part of increasing pediatric readiness. Myself and others have conducted a number of projects demonstrating that using simulation as a method for not only education, but for quality improvement, for assessing the quality of care in your emergency department and looking at those high stakes cases and presenting them on demand through simulation, looking at how your team does, looking at how your equipment is, looking at how your policies and procedures function, then reflecting on that performance through something called a debriefing, which would involve the team discussing the care with each other, as well as reflecting on that performance through a report out or the collection of data or metrics. Those more sophisticated types of simulation are often, in, often best done in partnership with your children's hospitals. 
So one of the questions that comes up quite frequently as we work with community hospitals, and particularly after we did that work that helped to improve pediatric readiness, where we visited those community hospitals and brought the simulation lab to them and conducted the simulation in situ, meaning within the workspace, was, can we do more simulations? And my answer is always yes, and wanting to support community hospitals in doing those simulations. Barriers to conducting the simulations are not only the cost of the simulator, but available educational resources and best practices. And I would strongly encourage you to reach out to your children's hospital because many of these things are widely available. And all simulators are not expensive. In a number of studies, we and others have demonstrated that there's not much of a difference between the use of high technology or high fidelity simulation and low fidelity or lower technology simulations. It's all about being fit for purpose, meaning it depends on your learning objectives. If you're really studying the complexities of placing a central line and working with a quite experienced provider, you may need a robotic mannequin that has very uh, technical haptic feedback, and those can be very expensive. And the same holds true for pediatric emergency care if you wanted to look at complex processes such as vent management. However, lower fidelity or lower technology mannequins can often be done without a computer application and can be done using things like do-it-yourself versions of training like we'll talk to about today, as well as use of screen emulator or YouTube videos to conduct those simulations. So when we look at studies comparing randomized trials of higher technology to lower technology simulations, the evidence is really pretty strong that it really depends upon your technique of how you do the simulation. So simulations done poorly with higher fidelity mannequins or higher technology mannequins do not lead to enhancement of knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And simulations done well with lower technology and sometimes handmade or do-it-yourself mannequins or simulators or models result in very important and effective improvements in knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And this has been exemplified in a number of large studies, including one in medical education uh, that demonstrated that there were no significant advantages in higher or lower fidelity simulation overall, and a number of other studies in pediatric care, and particularly pediatric resuscitation, which we do a lot of simulation with that compared a group of individuals participating in a scenario with the mannequin turned on, function as a higher technology mannequin, and the mannequin turned off, functioning as a lower technology mannequin, and the students and learners really did not find much difference. So you see an example here of a variety of simulators. In the upper left is the higher cost, higher technology mannequin that you might be familiar with, something called Sim Man. Uh, we've also used things like chicken. Um, this is sort of in jest here. We don't often eat the chicken after that, uh, but things like fruits and vegetables and existing equipment can be used uh, to conduct simulations. And there's a range of simulations, and again, it depends upon your objectives and trying to create the simulation experience to achieve those objectives and creating the simulation technology or resources to match those objectives. So if all you need is a child to be present in the room, a lower technology mannequin would suffice. If you need a child that's going to interact with you, you probably need a human and you might even need a patient uh, actor to play in that role depending upon what types of uh, techniques you're doing. And we do that sometimes for ultrasound simulation in our emergency department. If you are looking at things like push-pull fluid techniques or IV placement, you may not even need a simulator and you may be able to create do-it-yourself modules like we'll discuss here. One of the important things that I would stress is that you should be cautious about the equipment you're using for simulation and the crossover of that equipment with the real equipment. So if you are using equipment for simulation and using expired equipment or equipment that is no longer viable in the clinical setting, uh, I would strongly encourage you to label that for simulation use only or to consider for best practices only using uh, non-expired equipment for your simulations. While there's a higher cost, it decreases is the risk of transfer of that simulated resource into the clinical environment. There has actually been a sentinel event and a large uh, problem that occurred when simulated uh, fluids were uh, entered into a hospital's usage as a actual fluid source and those simulated fluids had not gone through some of the testing and had led to an infectious outbreak in that hospital. Um, there are labels uh, for simulation uh, equipment and resources that are freely available if you do choose to use expired medications, but I would just caution you that like with everything we do in healthcare, there are potential risks and benefits. So 
teaching with simulation, the goals of the training or educational interventions are to enhance participants' knowledge, meaning what they know about a clinical condition or uh, how well they can uh, provide information on that condition or understand that condition. Skills, such as psychomotor skills, uh, that might be the more often thing you think about, like placing an IV or placing an endotracheal tube or bag valve mask, but can also include things like teamwork, communication, leadership skills, and family-centered care skills. And then lastly, attitudes, as we mentioned before. Are, what is your attitude about a pediatric patient in your department? Are you feeling that you're not prepared or don't take care of children here, which is something that often comes up in lower volume departments? Or do you prepare, feel prepared and feel like you're well-trained and pediatric ready because you've had ongoing practice and while you may not have had a pediatric cardiac arrest in your department in four or five years, if you're practicing this on a monthly or annual basis even, it can provide opportunities for ongoing confidence building in addition to knowledge and skill building. The um, teaching using simulation can require a model as described here, but as I mentioned, uh, it can also allow you to use lower technology things. In some of our situations, we have used pillows or children's dolls. Um, and again, the case can be conducted using that higher technology mannequin or can use things like monitor emulators or even a person speaking through the vital signs or showing the valley signs on a PowerPoint slide. So uh, it is not necessary to have high cost equipment or high cost resources, I think it is very important to plan for your simulation, what your objectives are, and develop skills as a simulation educator, which we'll speak through in these modules, and match the education to your learner's needs. So this may be a brief session that will serve to train those providers on a skill that they are comfortable with but have not done in a while, or maybe a much more extensive session. It might even involve things like competency assessments to decide if a provider should be able to perform a skill such as a nurse performing an IO in your hospital. So within this do-it-yourself simulation module we are going to really focus today much more on the uh, psychomotor skills and the development of psychomotor skills models or simulators to practice on as well as some techniques and best practices for those environments and experiences I, I discussed earlier whether it's in person, at home, or in a training center. The modules that we'll focus on and that we have some resources so that you can create your do-it-yourself low-cost simulator today include airway skills, the push-pull method for IV fluid delivery, the stopcock method for drawing up accurate medications, and IV and IO insertion into an infant or child. These four were dictated by a needs assessment in our ongoing simulation and work with pediatric champions, our PECs across New England. And we hope that through each module, you can look at the PowerPoint uh, presentation, the introduction to the skill simulator, and the video clip showing how to put it together and then begin to use it. And we really encourage you to reach out to us to provide feedback, to provide tricks and tips if you have other ideas. And if you're interested in other simulation for either procedural training as mentioned here or other more sophisticated simulations that might involve teamwork communication or resuscitation please reach out to your regional children's hospital and we're here to help on both providing simulation support in the form of best practices and training in the form of cases and at times in the form of providing the technology or the resources should they be needed so in summary, our hope is that pediatric emergency simulation can be done anytime, anywhere, and that a inexpensive simulator can be as good, if not better, than an expensive simulator in the hands of a uh, facile, uh, well-trained simulation educator, which we hope you will be after watching these modules. And using a simulator plus your knowledge as a pediatric educator or a pediatric emergency care coordinator can really lead to you being the pediatric champion within your organization and the best outcomes for your patients. There is no feeling that uh, I, I can say matches that provider coming up to you after having taken care of a patient and saying, oh my gosh, Dr. Auerbach, Mark, thank you so much for doing that experience with the simulation. Uh, Prior to that case, I had not taken care of a patient in cardiac arrest that was a child for many years, and we had a patient present the next week. And because of that simulation, we were able to perform at a higher level. And because of that simulation, I was more confident. And because of that simulation, I had better knowledge. 
So my hope is that simulation uh, will become a part of your toolkit for pediatric readiness and pediatric preparedness. And again, we encourage you to watch the rest of these modules and reach out to us should you have any questions, comments, or feedback. Thank you so much and best of luck on your pediatric readiness endeavors. And thank you for all you do to ensure that all children get the highest quality of care whenever and wherever it is needed in New England and across the country.